Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Mendocino County, on the Round Valley Indian Reservation. I'm new to the internet, but have been interested in the existence of a large bipedal hominid in the regions of the world since I saw one when I was younger. At the time, my folks owned some property on the edge of the Round Valley Indian Reservation in Mendocino County, California. Their property overlooked the South Fork of the Eel River, affording an unobstructed view of the northern bank. While watching through binoculars, a herd of about 15 wild hogs of various sizes, approximately a half a mile away, I noticed movement higher up the slope and focused in time to watch a man in what appeared to be a fur coat walk briskly across a meadow of about 40 yards in circumference. Two odd things immediately struck me. First, this occurred in early August at around 4 p.m. The temperature was in the mid to high 90s. Yet, here was what appeared to be a large man, maybe six feet tall, moving rapidly in the full light of the sun in a long, closely fitting fur coat. Secondly, I was quite familiar with the area. Over the next few years, I began to become acquainted with the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomenon. Looking back, I'm convinced that what I saw was a female Bigfoot or a young adult. I based this conclusion upon the fact that the size of the man I saw was not impressive. What was impressive was his ability to move over rough terrain with such ease in the heat of an August afternoon. No one who was familiar with the trackless expanse of the American Northwest can have any doubt that unknown creatures could exist there. My opinion is that the more intelligent a creature, the more likely he is to remain less well known. But even with a higher intelligence, this creature has allowed itself to be observed. It is not only a quirk of history that no hard evidence has fallen into the right hands, at the right time, I believe that many pieces of hard evidence have been found and, through ignorance, have been stored in museum collections, personal collections, lost or destroyed. As I stated, I am new to the internet and so do not know proper procedures. On to the next one. in and around Alpine in San Diego in California. A family that lived at the end of a desolate road reported seeing bizarre, hairy creatures of different heights prowling the area at night. They were accompanied by a strong, pungent odor resembling rotten garbage. One of the creatures was about seven feet tall, the smaller one five feet, and the little one three or four feet tall. One report had it that the hairy creatures seemed to mimic human speech with their voice sounding very guttural. On to the next one. Warren Johnson, his brother Lewis, and several friends experienced many unusual experiences above Strawberry in Tulamine County in California. They often found footprints heard moans, grunts, snarls, snorts, tooth popping, and chest beating. Lewis also reported that he had looked out through a hole in the shelter wall, saw a shape enter a patch of moonlight and leave again as soon as he tried to call someone's attention to it. Lewis estimates the size as 10 feet tall, 4 feet across the shoulders, and as much as 750 pounds. Tracks were found that were 22 inches in length and had a five-foot stride. The area was pine forest at about 6,000 feet elevation. 
on to the next one. At Mammoth in Mono County in California, a sheriff's lieutenant saw an eight-foot-tall hairy humanoid southeast of town. It was a shaggy creature with outstretched arms. On to the next one. In Tahama County in California, four teenage boys were in a car on their way to Battle Creek to fish when a UFO was seen to swoop at the car. The boys then parked at Battle Creek Bridge and whilst there heard an odd scream coming from the bush. John Yaris, 16, flashed a light over the brush and illuminated a seven-foot-tall hairy humanoid with teardrop-shaped ears and lumps all over its body that was standing there. It turned and ran. So did the witnesses. Daryl Ranch, 16, James Yarth, and Robbie Cross headed back to the car, but to their horror, the car would not start. The boys pushed the car to start it. The hairy humanoid seemed to actually be wearing a uniform with lump-like pouches on the front like a kangaroo's pouch. Afterward, Daryl saw fireworks going off on pavement without sound. Then all the witnesses saw blue, white, orange, and red fiery objects moving erratically in the open field. One glowing ball assumed human shape on the side of the road. It was too much for the boys and they fled the scene. On to the next one. Four young people were at a campground in Lake Isabella in Kern County, California, when they saw a Bigfoot prowling around in the moonlight. On to the next one. At Palmdale in Los Angeles County in California, the witness drove into his carport one evening. There was total silence and the witness saw a large bush that was swaying as well as a rotten odor coming from it. There was no breeze though. Then the witness realized that the bush was actually a hairy humanoid. The witness fled inside and looked out of the window. They were paralyzed and felt controlled. The hairy humanoid was 50 feet away and 9 feet tall and the witness felt urged to go to it. Both the witness and humanoid stared at each other. On to the next one. At 7.30 a.m. on the road between Grants Pass, Josephine County, Oregon, and Eureka in Humboldt County in California, a seven-foot-tall Bigfoot stepped onto the path of a logging truck which ended up severely damaged. The creature was six foot tall, reddish haired, with a domed head like a human's, but with no neck and the arms were very long with the hands reaching down to the knees. The creature appeared not to be aware of the truck, which hurled it off the left shoulder of the road. By the time that the truck had stopped, the creature was gone and there were no traces of blood or hair on the damaged area. On to the next one. My partner in crime and I were setting up our still operation in Braxton County, West Virginia. We were moonshiners, which was and still is illegal in the United States. We had a lot of orders to fill for our peach and apple blend of shine. And so we were moving into the hills to find a suitable site for our still to be set up. Our method was to somewhat recycle locations where we had been in the path, and on this particular day, we had moved our operation down into a hollow we had been years before. This was a fairly deep ravine with a creek running through the middle of it, which is needed for any still operation. Without the water, you've got no liquor. At the site, we set four 50-gallon drums in place and filled them with the mash and water. When we were finished, we left the site to allow them to ferment. Our plan was to return later in the week, but as it turned out, we had a hell of a storm that week. 
It had come up from Florida and lingered over the state for several days. This just so happened to be the same time we had planned for the mash to be ready for processing. By the time the rain had let up, we were several days later than we had planned to fire up the still in order to make the shine. On a Tuesday morning, it was still drizzling while we were bringing all the components for the still down into the hollow. Everything in the area was soaking wet. The ground was so saturated with water that our boots were sinking into the forest floor wherever we stepped. As we made our way down, we could see from our elevated position that the creek had grown in size. It now looked like a small river reaching a point where it was only feet away from our mash drums, whereas we had left them some 30 feet away from the creek days earlier. After we made our way down to the bottom, the first thing that caught our attention was that the lid had been removed from one of the drums. As we peered into the drum, about half the mash was gone, which represented about 25 gallons of fermented mash. It had to have just happened because up until the night before, it was raining so heavily that if the lid had been removed then, it would have been overflowing instead of half empty. But that wasn't the real kicker about the whole thing. What I'm about to say to you was the reason for my contacting you in the first place, all around the drum, as well as leading up to it from the hollow and going away from it were footprints, large footprints from a booger which is what you folks call a Bigfoot. As best as we could tell, there seemed to be at least two, if not three sets of footprints. We could see where they had entered the site with the tracks, although overlapping each other, being made in a straight line, which is the way boogers walk. That being said, the footprints which they left when leaving the site were completely random and all over the place. There were also many areas where it appeared that the boogers were laying on the ground in the mud, either by choice or having fallen. My friend Ernie said, these damn boogers were drunk out of their minds over here. They ate up 25 gallons of fermented mash and were falling down drunk. Ernie was completely right in what he said. Even an animal would not lay down to rest in thick mud unless it was a hog. There were full body impressions in the mud from where they either fell down drunk or laid down in a drunken stupor. The trail of print leaving the site covered an area about 15 feet wide, appearing like a group of drunken soldiers had marched out of here arm in arm. It was the craziest thing that we had ever seen in all our days of shining. Now, all the area shiners as well as darn near everyone else have heard the tale of the Braxton County monster, as well as others having seen many boogers through the years. But this was the first time that any of us had seen some type of evidence for ourselves regarding their existence. There was no doubt about the prints that we had seen. They were fresh, more than likely having been made that night. If they had been made on the previous day, I'm convinced that they would have been washed away by the heavy rain. The smallest of the prints was about 15 inches, with the larger ones being over 20 inches. The impressions, which had been made from their bodies on the ground, were enormous. They looked like a thousand-pound hog had been wallowing around in the mud. On to the next one. Ever since I moved to Colorado, several of my friends kept telling me about how they had seen a Sasquatch. I had heard about this mysterious sounding animal ever since I was growing up in Oak Park, Illinois. By the time I moved to Boulder, Colorado, I was already aware of the many stories from around the country about the Bigfoot. So, when a couple of my newfound friends began telling me of their personal encounters, I was ready for the game. I listened one night in a local bar where several of us from the same company were getting to know each other. Since I was the new girl and a stranger to this wild country, 
Everyone wanted me to be aware of the dangers of living in the rugged and untamed mountain, many of which were so hostile and foreboding they had never been entirely explored. I was, as they say, taking everything in with a grain of salt when the subject had suddenly been changed to one of the couple's encounter with a Sasquatch. It actually sounded plausible, but owing to my Chicago heritage, I couldn't help but be obviously skeptical, and it must have showed because Demi got up and walked away in a huff. She soon returned, and I had a chance to explain my natural skepticism. So she got over it and said she understood, but that in this area, stories about sightings and encounters with Bigfoot were so common and so frequent that the locals had learned to listen for telltale signs that would instantly substantiate the truth or falsehood of a storyteller's claim of an encounter. As the evening wore on, I was entertained by many of the friendly locals who had themselves seen the Bigfoot, and some of these people had actually had a close encounter with one. A man of considerable age had ambled over to sit near our group of circled benches in this large, log-walled corner of the lounge, and after listening to several stories from members of our group, at which he had at times been nodding his head in a sort of affirmation of the accuracy of the stories, but when one of our party started how private and reclusive the Bigfoot are and how they would never hurt anyone, the old-timer suddenly got up and edged into the center of what had become a circle of listeners. He held up a weathered hand and said it was time he interrupted our group of Sasquatch lovers and tell us something we'd had better know before one of us city slickers got ourselves killed. He then flipped off his heavy woolen red and black checkered jacket, and that was when I saw he only had one arm. The old-timer next rolled up the left sleeve of his inside shirt and exposed a scarred stump that showed the part of his arm and the crudely stitched stump that ended just above his elbow. He lifted the bare stub and turned in a circle for all to see. With a slight tremble in his voice, he told us that this is what happens when you forget that Bigfoot is a wild animal. Then he sat facing us and explained how he had worked on a logging crew that supplied most of the lumber that was used to construct several of the major ski lodges in the area. Everyone called him Old Man Phelps. We never did find out his first name. And... He said the construction workers had lived right on the site and seldom had much time off to visit the towns in the area because they were limited by the short season, so they had to work with very little time off. They were well supplied with all of the luxuries that one could consume and even had a large and steady supply of what the old man described as drinking liquor. The liquor was forbidden during and even close to a man's shift. However, it was carefully monitored because, as the old man said, booze and chainsaws don't mix. We were all gathered closely around this very fascinating man as he regaled us with tales of the logging camp life. And then he became very reminiscent as his voice lowered and he told the camp suddenly beginning to have problems with disappearing food supplies and finally, having an encounter with a small Bigfoot, he called it a monkey monster. He told us how several of the men had surrounded the supply shed when the young ape kid was stealing supplies, and how they tied up the screaming and biting critter. He said it took about six husky loggers to finally tie it to a large tree near the mesh shack. According to the old man, Nobody made much of the capture because their group was well aware of Bigfoot. But this was the first time they had ever caught one. He said he was about five feet tall, but as strong as three men. They offered it food and water, but it just snarled and screeched so loud they finally dragged it to an unused supply shed and put logs up against the door at an angle 
and they went back to work. Their intent was to keep it there until the foreman returned from town and let him contact the authorities. After the first night, the old man said all was quiet. He said he'd taken his watch to guard the shed at around 10 the next night, and as he returned and was passing the shed, a huge ape came around the corner and slapped the log that was leaning against the door away. He said at the same time, the giant creature grabbed him by the arm and then, reaching out with its other huge paw, it snapped and tore his arm and then physically threw him so hard at the shed that he blacked out. After pausing to shudder visibly at the memory, the old man had another drink from his mug of beer and finished by warning us to never underestimate these critters. They're not the tame and friendly beasts some people think they are. The old man rolled his sleeve back down, put his coat back on, and as he turned to leave, he explained briefly how the camp doctor was barely able to save his life, and his arm from the elbow down was never found. The sincerity of this old-timer made a believer out of me. That was my introduction to Boulder, Colorado. Even after four years here of having done my share of camping and hiking, I still haven't seen a Bigfoot, nor do I really care to. My arm hurts just thinking about it. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!